If, if it's the change I think it is, then what you should have in your portfolio going forward can be very different from what it has been. Recently, Howard Marks has been discussing what he considers a pivotal moment for the U.S. economy. He predicts a rare significant shift that will mark a departure from the largely positive trends witnessed over the past 50 years. As the co-founder of Oak Tree Capital Management, Marx is known for his skepticism towards investment decisions based purely on forecasts. Instead, he bases his strategies on solid, real-time data and analysis, a method that has helped him amass a net worth exceeding $2 billion. Besides his financial acumen, Marx is well regarded for his insightful investment memos, which delve into key market developments he observes and anticipates. In his latest discussions, he points to a major shift he refers to as the sea change, which he believes could redefine the trajectory of the U.S. economy. Let's explore why he thinks the economy is at this turning point. The, the Fed discovered something called quantitative easing or the buying of bonds. Well, I don't, think, I don't think governments can keep us aloft forever. Over the past few decades, we've experienced unusually low interest rates, even seeing them drop to 0% and remain there for extended periods. This era of low rates has been so prolonged that many in the current generation might not realize that interest rates can also rise. This historical context sets the stage for understanding the economic shifts we might be facing today. In the period 09 through 13, the Fed took the F Fed funds rate to zero to fight the global financial crisis, left it there a long time, and didn't have any luck getting it back up into what you might think are normal ranges. So we had a low interest rate environment, which made life very easy for borrowers, asset owners, it was easy to run a business. The economy was, was, did well. We had the longest bull market in history, the longest economic recovery in history. Uh, we had very low incidence of default and bankruptcy. Uh, it was an easy world. In essence, just as nothing is permanent, the extended period of economic prosperity in the U.S. has shifted, particularly triggered by the pandemic, which led to global shutdowns. This was followed by significant monetary expansion, which in turn spurred inflation. In response, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, a move not witnessed in decades and certainly a first in the lifetime of those accustomed to seeing only declining rates. For many today, current interest rates seem exceptionally high, primarily because they have not experienced an increase in their lifetime. However, these rates are historically normal. Howard Marks notes that the present concern and alarm over rising rates stem from a lack of familiarity with such economic conditions as many have come to view persistently low interest rates as the norm. This adjustment to what are actually typical rates illustrates the broader anxiety and panic among those unaccustomed to this economic environment. You do have a model roughly in your head where you say in the memo uh, that you don't think that rates are high. They're kind of no, they're more normal. They're not high right. relative to my experience. The key insight from Howard Marks' discussion on the sea change is that the current challenges stem largely from people being accustomed to and comfortable with low interest rates, typically around 2% to 3%. This has been the norm for the last 20 years. However, when we examine the interest rate trends over the past five decades, we find that a 2% rate is exceptionally low and stimulative. This historical perspective highlights why today's adjustments to higher rates feel particularly jarring to a generation that has only known an environment of low interest rates. Uh, you know, between zero and two is uh, an emergency measure. And, you know, rates were, the, the Fed funds rate was zero much of the, probably the majority of the time in the 09 to 21 period. And that's inappropriate. It's, it, 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 it stimulates. You, sh you can't live on a, a shot of adrenaline every morning for 13 years. And it, it does uh, uh, subsidize borrowers and penalize lenders and savers. Um, and I would like to see a Fed get to a neutral position, which is neither stimulative nor restrictive, and I, I, and I, I describe that as two to four. According to Howard, Marks' observations, an ideal range for the Federal Reserve to set interest rates would be between 2% and 4%. However, current Fed rates are higher, hovering between 5.25% and 5.5%. This discrepancy arises because the Fed's primary concern remains unchecked inflation. Despite preferences for lower rates, the necessity to control inflation dictates maintaining higher interest rates, underscoring the delicate balance the Fed must manage in its monetary policy decisions. You know, we're at five and a quarter to five and a half on the Fed funds right now. That's a measure determined to crimp the economy to uh, kill off the excess inflation. The target is two, we're above two, 
cool off the economy until it moves toward two. In essence, our financial environment has developed such a dependency on extremely low interest rates that the current adjustment back to more standard rates feels uncomfortable and worrisome. Concerns are mounting as individuals face higher mortgage payments and businesses grapple with their debt loads, all of which are symptoms of having pushed economic limits during easier times. Howard Marks emphasizes that this sea change is impacting not only private sector debtors, but also the government. As both a borrower and a lender, the government is caught in the same cycle of rising interest rates. It faces the challenge of rolling over its existing debts at these higher rates, increasing the cost of servicing its debt. Marx reflects on how past conditions, robust economic recoveries, bullish markets, and extremely low interest rates allowed for an environment where companies could easily access capital and bankruptcies were rare. These conditions painted an overly optimistic picture of economic stability. During this period, the U.S. government consistently operated at a deficit, accumulating more debt each year. This fiscal strategy has led to rapidly increasing debt levels, exacerbated by the government's response to the pandemic. Now, as the debt becomes a more visible issue in everyday life, the government, like its citizens, must navigate the complexities of managing these obligations under less favorable economic conditions. If we reflect on the last, let's say, 10, 14 years, you would imagine that in a decade-long period of ultra-low interest rates, you would have had this explosion in leverage. There are several reasons for that. But this period has been quite odd because we then had the pandemic, which led to the strengthening of balance sheets for both corporates and households off the back of a monster fiscal transfer. And a question I think that Lisa and I hear a lot, Howard, is where is the leverage now? Where is the leverage now? Well, we know that the leverage is in the government, that the, the government has taken on a lot of leverage as, as part of its uh, rescue mechanism. Uh, we had two serious problems, the global financial crisis, to kick off that low rate period you're talking about, and then the pandemic to, to bookend it. And in both cases, uh, the, the Fed discovered something called quantitative easing, or the buying of bonds, and um, it, it, it really did a great job of saving the economy on both occasions, but it loaded up its balance sheet with debt. Howard Marks provides a comprehensive explanation of the current fiscal challenges faced by the U.S. government. A situation exacerbated by policies aimed at easing economic pressures for individuals and businesses. One key strategy employed was quantitative easing, which involved the Federal Reserve, Fed, buying government bonds. This influx of cash undoubtedly supported the economy during critical times, but also significantly increased government debt. The government must eventually repay this debt to the Fed, and herein lies a critical issue. While the Fed could theoretically continue to support the government by printing more money and purchasing additional bonds, this is only feasible when inflation is under control. Unfortunately, Inflation remains elevated, restricting the Fed's ability to intervene without exacerbating the situation. Here's where the problem intensifies. As the government faces the need to roll over its debt, it must do so at higher interest rates due to the current economic climate. This increases the cost of servicing the debt, diverting funds that could have been used for other governmental functions. Thus, the U.S. government finds itself in a precarious position where managing its debt load under rising interest rates and ongoing deficits becomes increasingly challenging highlighting the significant fiscal constraints it now faces. Is it too simplistic to say, if the increase in leverage has been on the sovereign balance sheet, that's where the risk is? How do you frame that? How do you think about that? Well, first of all, uh, I don't invest in sovereigns. Uh, and the, the trouble is that in sovereigns, other things matter. Uh, you know, uh, they, they don't, it, it, when we look at companies, we ask, Will, do they make money? Will they make money? Will they be able to pay their debt? Yeah. The bank, governments don't make money. They're not expected to make money, and they pay their debt by running the printing press. So that's a very different function. And then they if, have the ability of extending the cycle at the same time. I think this is what I'm trying to get my head around. If they've absorbed basically the leverage that existed elsewhere, yeah. and they are less exposed to the challenges of companies that you would invest in, are you thinking of a much longer cycle as a consequence? Um, well, I don't think I don't think governments can keep us aloft forever. The crux of the issue, as laid out by Howard Marks and echoed by financial experts like Ray Dalio, is that the government's ability to continuously support the populace during economic downturns is not sustainable without consequences. The extensive measures taken during the pandemic, notably through government spending facilitated by the Federal Reserve's purchase of bonds, provided immediate relief but also led to significant inflation, which remains a persistent challenge. The current situation underscores that there is no perpetual safety net that the government can provide without financial repercussions. 
As inflation continues to be a concern, the Federal Reserve has shifted its priorities towards controlling it, showing reluctance to purchase additional bonds from the government, a process that could further fuel inflation. This has led to a crucial realization. The debt issue is paramount and must be addressed. The government's growing debt burden, exacerbated by the need to roll over existing debts at higher interest rates amidst ongoing deficits, poses a substantial risk to economic stability. If left unchecked, this debt problem will persist and potentially worsen, necessitating significant policy changes and economic adjustments to stabilize the situation. Marx and Dalio's agreement on the urgency of resolving the debt issue highlights the severity of the fiscal challenges that lie ahead. Let's take the U.S. government as an example of somebody that maybe should be bankrupt in some respects because we borrowed so much money. We have $32 trillion of debt. We're running an annual deficit this year will be roughly $2 trillion. Are you um, worried about our ability to pay off this debt? And, and not, if we can't, will it devalue the dollar? Um, it's clearly worrisome. Uh, n there's never been uh, there's never been a bankruptcy of the U.S. or a company or a country like it. So we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, right now, the U.S. dollar is what's called the reserve currency of the world, and we get to print them. And we can print in the short run. We can print as many as we want. And as long as that's the case, uh, we're not going to go under. Uh, uh, it's like if you have an unlimited checking account, you can pay your credit card bills without, uh, without limitation. Um, we just don't know where it's going. That's the problem. We've reached a point where the outlook is decidedly unfavorable. Having outlined the origins of the current crisis, its present state, and potential future developments, let's consider Howard Mark's advice for investors. He offers strategies for navigating a landscape where high interest rates are expected to persist. The, the only thing I'm sure of is that if, if interest rates are higher, the people who invest in credit instruments, which is what we do, uh, are buying in at higher yields and invariably will have higher returns than they have in the recent past. So, so today's rates are not high historically, but they're certainly higher than we had from 09 through 21, which means the returns on credit investing fixed income investing, bond investing, loan investing, will be higher than those in that period, which were, you know, really uh, paltry. With declining interest rates, the appeal of purchasing treasury bonds diminishes, while businesses may find favorable conditions for growth, provided their capital is channeled into stocks rather than bonds. Interestingly, Howard Marks points out that he invests in credit instruments. Given the current trend of rising interest rates, which are expected to remain high, investing in loans becomes a more attractive option. Higher interest rates mean that lenders can earn more interest on the money they lend out, as it becomes more challenging for stocks to grow due to the increased difficulty in financing and expansion under these conditions, capital tends to shift from stocks to bonds. In light of this, Howard Marks advises investors to consider putting their money into bonds during this period.